Testing. 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 All right. We are good. Let's make sure our stuff is set up here. Great. All right, welcome to another stream. Um, today we are going to be uh, reading another paper. This is probably going to be our last stream for the week tomorrow. Uh, to do a long weekend for the holidays, so probably not going to be a stream uh, this Friday or the Monday after that, but we'll see what happens. You know, sometimes I might just do a stream anyways. So today we're going to close with a super fresh paper that is also incredibly impressive. This is Scalable Diffusion Models with Transformers. This is coming out on uh, December 19th, which is literally less than a week ago. Four days ago, it was on Monday. Um, this is coming out of UC Berkeley and uh, New York University, but the, uh, the real kind of people who paid for uh, all the compute budget is uh, the Meta AI, the FAIR team. So the Facebook research, this would be Jan LeCun and his squad, basically. Although not directly Jan LeCun, of course. Jan LeCun has probably a variety of different researchers under him, and then people under those people, and then people under those people, and then finally you get to these two people here, William Pebbles and Signing Xie. So there's a GitHub repo for this. Um, they do have the code. They have uh, the PyTorch models. They have pre-trained weights. Um, and everything, which is quite nice, but unfortunately this is a uh, CC by NC uh, license, so you can't actually use this. Yeah. So basically you can't use this in your startup, but you can use it for your uh, project as much as you want. Um, cool, so let's get started. This is a very nice eye capturing kind of opening image here on the page and um, kind of a, a blockbuster uh, sentence here. Diffusion models with transformer backbones achieve state of the art image quality. And state of the art image quality is kind of a bold claim, but when you look at these images, these are genuinely state-of-the-art. This is extremely crisp uh, picture of a parrot and this puppy and this uh, husky dog here. The semantic information is also very, very correct, right? The, the, the number of legs, the wings, the feathers on the wings, there's no artifacts either at the texture scale nor at the kind of macro scale. It's like Every sing at every single scale, this image is correct. I was especially impressed here by like the little details here, such as this, the wrist of the dog, right? The top part of the wrist. That is, that is such a subtle detail that the model gets 100% correct. So, very, very interesting stuff. Um, this is their new transformer model diffusion model that kind of uses a transformer uh, backbone. They call it DIT-XL2, so I think they're gonna have a couple different sizes of this. And they're using uh, ImageNet at 512 by 512 and 256 by 256. So these are image sizes. This is a 512 by 512 image, and this is a 256 by 256. Um, this should actually be our color for uh, numbers. We have different highlight colors for different types of information. So yellow is just kind of generic information, blue is specific numbers, and then uh, green is uh, mathematical definitions of terms. 
So, yeah, let's get started. We explore a new class of diffusion models based on the transformer architecture. We train latent diffusion models, okay. So the diffusion is happening in the latent space. Replacing the commonly used UNET backbone with a transformer that operates on latent patches. We analyze the scalability of our diffusion transformers through the lens of a forward pass complexity as measured by GFLOPs. Okay. We find that DITs with higher GFLOPs through increased transformer depth width or increased number of input tokens consistently have lower FID. Yeah, increased width or increased number of input tokens are better. So, I mean, this isn't news to anybody that's been in machine learning for the past 10 years, right? The bigger you make these models, the deeper you make these models, the wider you make the model, the more data you train it on, the better you're going to get. Uh, our largest DIT XL2 outperform all prior diffusion models on the class conditional ImageNet benchmarks. Um, State-of-the-art FID. So FID, uh, for Shea, inception distance, for those that are new to the channel, is basically a way to kind of subjectively measure image quality, or quantitatively measure image quality. Um, there are some issues with it, but hey, getting the best FID score is also not easy, so... If they did get the best FID score, I would definitely be bragging about it like they did here. Okay. Machine learning is experience a renaissance. Yep. Neural architectures for NLP, vision, and several other domains have been subsumed by transformers. I agree, there's been a consolidation in the architecture space. Uh, diffusion models have been at the forefront, yet all adopt a conventional unit. Architecture is the de facto choice. Yeah, so UNETs are basically these kind of covnets that start uh, with a very kind of, you can think of it as wide. There's more dimensions in a covnet, but in the, in your head, think of like kind of the width of, a, of just like a fully connected neural network as kind of an analogy for it. And they start very wide and then they kind of have a choke point and then they go back to being very wide. And that's what the U shape means, the, the U shape of that architecture. But ultimately, they're still based on transform or on uh, confnets, right? So, largely, what this paper is doing is saying, "Hey, let's replace the that kind of confnet part that's very popular in these diffusion models, and let's just replace it with transformers." And then, because we're meta and Facebook AI research, let's make the biggest, baddest transformer we can. And it turns out that, that even that, that simple concept is how you get to these ridiculously crispy images. We show that the UNET bias is not crucial to the performance of diffusion models, and they can be readily replaced with standard designs, such as transformers. As a result, diffusion models are well poised to benefit from the recent trend of architecture unification. We focus on a new class of diffusion models based on transformers. We call them diffusion transformers, or DITs for short. DITs uh, adhere to the best practices of VITs, vision transformers. So I'm, they'll explain the transformers probably, but the way vision transformers work, right? If 
if in a ConvNet you're taking this little patch and you're convolving it across the image, in a vision trans or in a vision transformer, what you're doing is you're taking the image, you're cutting it into these little patches, right? So you're cutting it into this grid, and then you're feeding each of those little uh, patches into the transformer. And transformers are originally designed for sentences, right? So it's like a a sequence of tokens. And when you're doing here is the same thing, except you're feeding the little patches of the image. So each patch of the image is is is, af is as if it was the word token in a sentence, and you're feeding the whole image patch by patch. More specifically, we studied the scaling behavior transformers with respect to network complexity and sample quality. Okay. They latent diffusion models, right? So they're performing the diffusion in latent space. We can successfully replace the unit backbone with the transformer. There is a strong correlation between the network complexity and the sample quality. Uh, so this is the high capacity backbone, which is 118.6 gigaflops and they're able to get a uh, state-of-the-art 2.27 FID on the 256 by 256 image net generation benchmark. Um, so here you get a sense of the scale in this figure. So image net generation with DITs, the bubble area indicates the flops of the diffusion model. So FID 50K, lower is better. So here you go. This is the FID score, which is a rough uh, a quantitative metric that roughly estimates the image quality. So lower is better. You can see the, the big circles represent big models. So you have DIT small, uh, DIT medium, I guess, DIT large, and then DIT XL, where this is going to be the biggest model here. And you can see that the there's a very clear kind of pattern here where the, the biggest models train on the most. What is the bubble area indicates the flops. So this is the size. Performance steadily improves. Our best model, DIT XL2, is compute efficient and outperforms all prior base net models. And these are uh different ones here. So LDMAG, LDM4G, and ADMUG. So this is an important point here, right? Um, you have the the big, uh, their big D DIT XL, and then you have this other one, ADM here. And ADM is a much bigger bubble, right? By kind of the logic that we've just been saying, this is a significantly larger model, therefore it should perform better than this one. But that's not exactly how the kind of uh, scaling laws work, right? If you have the same architecture, then a bigger version of that kind of same architecture will perform better than a smaller version of that architecture. But you can still find architectures that are smaller than other types of architectures that perform better than those. So scale is uh, sufficient but not required in order to get state-of-the-art results. You can get state-of-the-art results uh, with uh, better architecture and smaller size. It's just that finding that better architecture is way harder than just scaling the architectures that you already have, and that's why scaling is such an appealing solution to just improve the performance of these things. One second, I'm going to be back. Okay, let's get into this related work section. So we have transformers have replaced domain-specific architectures across language, reinforcement learning, and meta-learning. They have shown remarkable scaling properties under increasing model size, training, compute, and data in the language campaign, language domain. Okay. 
They have also been trained on discrete codebooks as both autoregressive models and mass generated models. Denoising diffusion probabilistic models. This is just the kind of official name of diffusion models. I think in the original 2015, I want to say, paper where they someone kind of proposed them. I don't know if they get official credit for being the first diffusion model paper, but I think that's around the timeline. Improvements in the past two years have largely been driven by improved sampling techniques, most notably ooh, most notably the accidental clicking of that. Classifier free guidance, uh, predict noise instead of pixels, and using cascaded DTM. So classifier free guidance. That's where you uh, you kind of have this dropout in the uh, context that you're or in what you're conditioning the model with, and sometimes you give it null, sometimes you give it a class token. Um, predicting noise instead of pixels, and then also not only the the noise but the uh, mean and the standard deviation of the noise, so like the the mean and variance of the noise. So predicting the parameters of a distribution that, that represents the noise rather than kind of the noise directly. And then using uh, cascaded DDPM pipelines where low resolution based are par trained in parallel with upsamplers. Okay, sure. When evaluating architecture complexity and image generation to use parameter counts. Yeah, parameter counts can be poor proxies of the complexity of image models since they do not account for image resolution. So much of the model complexity is through the lens of G-flops. I agree with this. I think that depending on your architecture, the actual number of parameters isn't necessarily indicative of like how much compute it takes so I think using uh, things such as gflops or just memory, right? Like more realistic, more quanti- more, not quantitative, but like real world uh, ramifications of the compute footprint of that model is more useful, right? So I think in the future, I'd love to see, here's how many GPUs we trained it on and how many flops were put through those GPUs. Here's the size of the GPU required to even run this. Right. That's one thing that a lot of these papers shy away from is that they don't they don't tell you how big your GPU needs to be to even run this model. Right. And I feel like that's something that could be useful to know or would be useful for someone in the real world. OK. So preliminaries here, there's a section on diffusion models and then a section on latent diffusion models. So a lot of math in here, so let's get into it. We review some basic concepts. Okay, so Gaussian diffusion models, where Gaussian is the noise. Yep. And Gaussian is the forward noising process. So you're applying noise to real data, x naught. So this is your uh, your image in some papers, but in this paper is going to be a latent factor, so x naught. Um, this is a normal distribution. So actually we can just delete this. This is a Gaussian. Uh, you have these hyperparameters, alpha bar sub t are hyperparameters that define the uh, Guys, I keep clicking on the references. Oh, hello, M9. Is the size of the models really just how many transformers they used? Uh, kind of. The 
width and depth of the transformers. Uh, transformers, right, like they, they have an attention kind of mechanism and like the tension mechanism is very sensitive to the width of that uh, sequence. So the wider the input sequence, the very quickly it gets much more memory intensive and much more compute intensive. So it's like a combination of how many transformer layers they have, but also how big each of those transformer layers are. Okay. Diffusion models are trained to learn the reverse process. Uh, yeah, so this, sorry, going back to the sentence before this, you can basically take this uh, noising function, which is uh, the, where the amount of noise added per time step t is modulated by this hyperparameter alpha bar sub t. And you can do a reparameterization trick, which basically you pull out that alpha bar sub t and then you can just use a normal distribution here. So you see this in reinforcement learning a lot. They use this to actually uh, push gradients through a uh, reinforcement learning agent that uh, outputs the mean and the variance of a distribution. This is basically the same reparameterization re trick, but here applied to the uh, noising process of a diffusion model. Uh, learn to reverse the process, which inverts the forward process corruptions. This is basically just removes the noise. Reverse process is trained with the variational lower bound of the log likelihood. So this is the, the statistical reasoning behind the loss that are used that is used for this, where basically you have here the the loss that you're using for theta, right, where theta is the parameters of your neural network P that approximates this uh, noising function or the opposite noising function T or Q, this theoretical noising function. And the loss is basically the KL divergence here. This is uh, a form, a way to kind of evaluate two different distributions and say how similar are these distributions. So KL divergence, let's get the official name here. So KL divergence, otherwise DKL, between two distributions P and Q is a simple interpretation of the KL divergence P from Q is the expected excess surprise from using Q as a model when the actual distribution is P. While, it's dis while, while it is a distance, it is not a metric in the most familiar type of distance. It is not symmetric in the two distributions in contrast to variation of information. So that definition kind of sucks, but basically you're saying how similar is my P of theta here, which is my neural network, and then this Q star, which is the inverse Q, which is this noising process here. So how close are those two distributions over all time steps t? And I want those to be as close as possible. Uh, excluding additional irrelevant terms. Since both q star and p theta are Gaussian can be evaluated the mean and covariance of the two distributions. By reparameterizing mu theta as a noise prediction network, sigma theta, or epsilon theta, the model can be trained using simple mean squared error between the predicted noise. There you go. Sigma theta t and the ground truth sampled Gaussian noise. Okay. So this is the actual uh, loss here. You're basically just taking the noise minus the predicted noise. But in order to train diffusion models with a learned reverse process covariance, the full DKL term needs to be optimized. So this is uh, kind of what I was referring to before, where you can you can train the the kind of the mean of the noise directly, but if you also want the uh, variance part as well, then you have to add this part here. Training sigma theta, capital sigma theta with a full L. Okay, 
classifier free guidance this is the trick that we keep seeing uh, over and over again here where you have a class label C and uh, you're adding this C so you're not just your neural network is not just predicting the image at the previous time step with the current image it's also predicting the it's predicting the image at the previous time step with the current image and this class label C so in ImageNet the class label is going to be something like dog or airplane or uh, cat or something like that. So your noise and the variance of your noise are conditioned on that class label. Here they just kind of, this is the, the conditional, the pro conditional probability of the class given the, given the image and that's ultimately what you're kind of optimizing by doing this. Here they're just using uh, Bayes rule to uh, reorder that and then this is the gradient. So the gradient of X with respect to the log probability of the class label C conditioned on the X which is going to be a latent vector is this. So now you've basically reframed it the other way, right? You use Bayes rule to say to kind of flip these terms. So class label conditioned on uh, X and here basically you see how using Bayes rule you flipped it around and now you have uh, X conditioned on class label and X. Evaluating the diffusion model with C equals null is done by randomly dropping out C during training it. This is the kind of dropout uh, part of classifier free guidance. Training diffusion models directly in, in high resolution pixel space can be computationally prohibitive. So latent diffusion models do this uh, by uh, performing the diffusion directly in the latent space. They use off-the-shelf convolutional BAEs and transformer-based DDPMs. Okay, so they introduce, that's the, that's the background there, and now we're on to section 3.2, which is diffusion transformer, specifically what the design space of their uh, novel architecture is here. So we aim to be as faithful as to the standard transformer architecture as possible to retain its scaling properties. Okay. DIT is based on the vision transformer architecture, which operates on a sequence of patches. Okay. So the input to DIT is a spatial representation Z. Right, this is the uh, latent embedding. Uh, so the images themselves are 256 by 256 by 3 and the latent has 32 by 32 by 4 so you can see how it's much lower dimensional which means all of your code is just going to run faster because your transformers are operating on a smaller piece of data. So they do have uh, VIT, frequency-based positional embeddings. So positional embeddings are basically just uh, an additional little piece of information that you put in with each patch. So whenever you take an image and then you break it into these patches, right, uh, for, here's a good picture for this, patch uh, VIT transformer, if I spelled it right. 
Yeah, so here. So, right, they take an image and then they break it into these little patches and then each of those little patches, usually you'll have a little piece of information along with that that's called the position encoding, right? And usually they're, they're, it's basically just like a way of telling the network where was this patch in the original image. And people generally use these kind of like sine, cosine functions uh, to, to tell the network that. So the number of tokens T created by Patchify is determined by the patch size hyperparameter P. And they probably just use the ones that uh, VIT had, because right, these are uh, people working at uh, Meta AI, Facebook AI research, right? I don't, like generally in that type of organization, like you're not gonna wanna mess with the code too much. You're, you're just gonna use the VIT code that's checked into that repo, you might tune it just a tiny bit, but like a lot of these hyperparameters aren't necessarily tuned for this particular application. They're tuned for whatever the original application of the paper that wrote that code is. So not only does that mean, or I guess what that ultimately means, sorry, is that you can probably get better results. If you took this, uh, this all the stuff that they did here, all the code that they used, and then kind of rewrote it and then retuned all the hyperparameters specifically for this application, you could, there's probably more uh, juice to squeeze out of this lemon. Okay, having P will quadruple T and at least quadruple transform G flops. So this is the actual, they use P equals two, four, and eight. So actually this is smaller. I think in the original VIT they use 16 and 14 for the uh, total number of patches, but here they're using two, four, and eight. So these are smaller patches, actually. Okay, the input tokens are processed by a sequence of transformer. In addition to noise image inputs, sometimes process additional conditional information such as noise, time, step, class, labels, C, and natural language, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so what they mean here is that uh, here, when you're, you're ultimately, this is your diffusion model up here, right? It's uh, predicting the image at a previous noising step compared to the image at the current noising step, and you can condition it on different things. And people condition it on the class label, such as dog or cat or whatever, but people also condition it on the time step and the natural language here, that this is the text prompts. So you can condition it on the text prompt or more specifically an encoded version of that text prompt, usually with a large language model such as clip. Simply append the vector embeddings of T and S as two additional tokens. Uh, this is similar to CLS tokens. Cross attention block. We concatenate the embeddings into a length two sequence, separate, okay, separate from the image token sequence. Transformer blocks is modified to include an additional multi-head cross attention layer that only looks at these uh, condition labels. So this cross attention, this extra cross attention head that only looks at these uh, con condition labels which are the text and the class are only 15% overhead. Following the uh, widespread usage of adaptive normalization layers. Standard layer norm with adaptive layer norm. So you have scale and shift parameters. So uh, layer normalization, what's a good summary of layer normalization? So in these neural networks, when you're training them right, you want all the numbers to be well distributed and, and kind of like well shaped, right? You don't want a bunch of numbers that are very big or skewed to one side or another. You want everything to be kind of centered around zero and then uh, going 
positive and negative, kind of negative one to one centered around zero, standard deviation of one. That's that's kind of what you want. Every number, every little weight, every little bias you in within that neural network during training, you want it to be roughly in that range. And they call that kind of nicely shaped, right? What layer normalization is doing is it's taking all the activations in a layer and then normalizing them during training. And what this does is it kind of allows the, the gradients to flow a little bit nicer, it allows the network to learn cleaner, and learn better representations, and there's a huge variety of these kind of normalization tricks. There's batch normalization, layer normalization, um, different kinds of those that have different uh, hyperparameters, and uh, generally you just kind of want to use the best the ones that come out of the box and just put them into your network and then just go from there. But if you do know what you're doing and you do kind of uh, have access to maybe more advanced uh, normalization uh, stuff, you could definitely add it in there. And I think these guys being part of uh, meta research, they can they definitely have access to that. Okay, so here's another layer normalization, ADA LN0. Okay, so not only are they doing this layer normalization kind of in the within the transformer blocks, which I think is what this one's doing, this ADA LN, they're also doing it uh, here where they, they apply it immediately prior to any residual connection so they're also doing some kind of layer normalization on the residual connection so residual connections are let's go to the architecture image so something like this this arrow here is a residual connection it kind of skips a bunch of layers so residual connections are a way to uh, take input or output from a lower level of the neural network and, and feed it back up to a higher level of the neural network. And it allows uh, information to flow between kind of the, the different abstraction layers of a neural network, right? And the neural network generally at the bottom, at the lowest layers, the layers that are closest to your input, you're going to have uh, more uh, kind of texture or like uh, high frequency or like kind of base kind of abstractions and then as you go higher and higher and higher in the neural network you're going to have more abstract abstractions if that terminology even makes sense but having some communication between those uh, it's an old idea uh, but it's a very good idea the residual connections uh, so here in figure three we have just a generic uh, transformer with a multi-head attention uh, this is showing you the this this different layer normalization that they're doing. So these these parameters here, gamma two, beta two, alpha two, uh, they're just different hyperparameters that are used to kind of normalize uh, the these layers here, the scale and shift layers. Conditioning via adaptive layer norm, cross attention, and extra input tokens. So here you have the latent space, or, or the noise latent. So they're taking their image, they're, they're converting it into a latent vector. Then they're taking that latent vector and they're patchifying it to, right, patchifying it into two, four, or eight little, little mini patches. And then they're feeding those patches along with a uh, position embedding into their transformer, which is reading them like a sentence. And then this transformer, right, has your kind of standard uh, attention, self-attention, where it kind of it looks at each part of that little sentence and how, how much attention it has to each other part of that little sentence. They have multiple bricks of this in a row with residual connections. And then they're also doing this uh, layer normalization at each multi-head attention to make sure that in each step of this, 
the inputs and outputs to this transformer are nice and normalized and clean and well shaped so that when you feed them to the next layer it works well and I think the deeper and bigger you make these uh, transformer architectures the more and more important that uh, good normalization during training is is and it's not just transformers I think the just with any neural network the deeper and bigger that you make it and the longer that you're training it for the more uh, things like layer norm and batch norm uh, become useful and uh, yeah so once you go through all those transformer blocks you have another layer norm here and then you take that and you use it to predict the noise that it's going to uh, remove or add to the uh, little patch or the, the latent sorry and then you also predict the variance of that noise okay So they have a MLP that outputs the zero vector for the like kind of null class. Little trick there. Okay, so model size. We apply a sequence of n DIT blocks, and uh, each of them has a hidden dimension of size d. Okay, so they have four different um, sizes here. Okay, so these are your different transformers. And actually, um, M9, you had a question of the model. Here is the actual uh, size. So DITS has 12 transformers, layers, or 12 transformer layers with six total multi-attention heads and a hidden dimension, right, the width of 384. And then the biggest model has 28 total transformer layers, 16 heads, multi-attention heads in that stack, and the width of that is 1152. So you can see how just making it wider and deeper uh, significantly increases the gigaflops there. Both of these outputs have a shape equal to the original spatial input. We arrange the decoded tokens into their original spatial layout. Okay, so this actually the the last part here of the image of the name is the size of patches. So DITXL2 means diffusion transformer, the largest size XL, and then with a, a patch factor of two. So it's it's cutting the patch in two pieces. So if we actually go back to the original image, this is the one that they use DITXL2. So it, it really only cuts it into two things. That's interesting. I would have thought the DIT XL8 would be the best here. So, um, given a patch size p by p and a spatial interpreter. Oh, okay, no, p. It's p by p. So, two p of two means four total patches. Uh, sequence of length t equals i over p squared. Yeah, so you have your original image, which is of some dimension i, right? You have some channels, c, uh, and then you're splitting that into p patches on each dimension and flattening it out into this sentence, right? So this image, or in, it's not an image, it's a latent, but represents the image, and that latent is converted into this sentence of little patches. And 
we initialize the final layer with zero and otherwise use standard weight initialization techniques from VIT. Um, constant learning rate of one times 10 to the fourth. No weight decay. Interesting, okay. That's that's good because I mean this this paper is impressive and they're not even doing like any fancy weight scheduling or scheduling within the noise of the transformer or within the noise of the diffusion training as far as I understand. So that's pretty cool. Do they prune or does it auto prune and that become the optimal transformer size? Uh, the size you train it at is the size used at inference. I don't think they are doing pruning for this, but you could if you wanted to reduce the size for uh, production use. Is there a fast way to reduce the transformer size or scale it up to see the effect? Uh, the size is, the performance is going to depend on the size of the model when it was trained. Um, you could probably use a, an upscaler if you wanted larger image sizes with a smaller transformer. Okay, unlike much prior work, we did not find learning rate warm-up nor regularization. We maintain an exponential moving average of DIT weights. Okay, so they are doing a little bit of weight decay. Weight decay is where you take the weights inside the neural network themselves and then actually just slowly make them smaller and smaller. And I actually think that, that your brain does something like this too. Your brain is can basically, like if you're not using neurons for a specific purpose in your brain, your brain will slowly downregulate those neurons, and I think that weight decay in a way is like emulating that, which is interesting. <laughs> uh, okay. Our training hyperparameters are almost entirely retained from ADM. We did not tune learning rates, decay warm-up schedules. Adam B1. Yeah, there's so much that they didn't tune for this paper that, you know, there's just so much more juice you can squeeze out of this. So I would not be surprised if there's another paper within six to eight months from less than that, like six months, uh, from these same people or from other people at uh, Meta AI Research that basically just like makes, optimizes all of this and then gets even better results. Yeah, because even here they're saying the off the shelf pre trained VAE model. Uh, interesting from stable diffusion. That's quite interesting. The VAE. It, Encoder has a down sample factor of eight, um, right? It basically goes from your uh, 256 by 256 by three image into a latent vector or an embedding of 32 by 32 by four. And diffusion hyperparameters. Tmax 1000. Uh, 
Okay. Good old Frisché inception distance here. Standard model, standard metric for evaluating generative models of images. I'm triggered. Uh, 250 sampling steps. Okay, so in yesterday's paper, we saw 1,000 uh, noising steps. Here, they're using 250 noising steps, right? So smaller amount of noising steps. And we have uh, red papers where uh, they break it and bring it down to one noising step. One is kind of a stunt. I don't think realistically anybody's going to be doing that or that's going to become the standard. I think kind of the, the low hundreds or low tens are probably where it's where you're going to get all the best performance in the future, the right trade-off between uh, speed and performance. Okay, so they also use a couple different met other metrics here, inception score and then precision recall. I wonder what precision and recall are in this context, right? Those are classification metrics, so maybe they're training a classifier. We implement all models in JAX. Oh, this is actually super interesting. And train on TPU v3 pods. That is, so, Facebook has always been a PyTorch shop, right? Where PyTorch originally comes from Torch, which is kind of, was originally developed by kind of the kind of like Jan LeCun sphere of deep learning. But JAX is a variant, uh, is kind of like a spin-off from TensorFlow. JAX is closer to TensorFlow than it is to PyTorch. JAX comes out of Google and is written by people to largely to fit into the TPUs, right? The Google specific hardware architecture. So having Facebook people here implement their models in JAX, which is coming out of Google and train it on Google hardware. That is kind of interesting, right? I think a year or two ago, the anything that came out of Facebook, it's implemented in PyTorch and they're running it on NVIDIA GPUs. So here seeing uh, Facebook researchers implement stuff in uh, JAX, which is a Google framework, and then putting training it on Google hardware. That is uh, definitely interesting. Low key, uh, maybe we should be buying Google stock. <laughs> um, so here you have the big model here, trains 5.7 iterations per second on a TPU v3 256 pod. Yeah, so I mean, these are, this is still huge. Like one TPU v3 is already kind of expensive. Imagine t a, a pod, right? Like this server rack with 256 TPUs on it. So it is important to note that all the results in this paper, all this stuff, like you're not gonna be able to do this on your NVIDIA GPU at home. This is a massive like server box of TPUs and they're training on it for days. Uh, so they have a couple different sizes here. Measure the FID. Okay. They have here some comparisons. We sample from all 12 of our DIT models after 400K training steps using the same input latent noise and class label. So actually, why don't we try to calculate that? There's 400,000 training steps. Each step takes 5.7 or 5.7 iterations per second. So 400, one, two, three, 400,000 training steps over 5.7 iterations. That's that many seconds uh, divided by 60, divided by 60. So it's 19 hours of training. Uh, TPU v3 Google cloud price. Um, Come on, just give me the price, Google. Okay. So basically somewhere between on demand, you could say $3, but they probably have a, a discount. So we can just say $2. So 
19 hours times, again, this is a 256 TPU pod, times each one is, uh, each hour cost $2. So it's $10,000 per model that they train here. So they have 12 different VIT. So each of these little squares took them twelve or ten thousand dollars to train, roughly. So this this little three by four grid here, this is over a hundred thousand dollars in training cost for this little chart, <laughs> which is crazy to think about, right? Like you pay a hundred thousand dollars and then you get like one shitty picture of a frog. Uh, yeah, and decreasing patch size, increasing transformer size. So more patches, bigger model, you get the best. And I think the patch size is honestly more important here, right? Like, because it allows, it gives you more global information. Right? I think this dog and this parrot show it the best, right? That even with a big transformer, if your patches are just the entire image, then, like, you're just going to get this one grainy blob. But if you break up the uh, pat the image into a bunch of little patches, then you get the fine details at each of those little patches. Um, cool. Hundred k to train. What does it take to run? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> probably just a couple dollars per image if they already have a model sitting there ready to use but the cost of the model sitting there ready to use is what is expensive yeah it's like the way you have these systems in production it's like it's not entirely clear right because if you're doing it on demand if you have a service where you have one of these big diffusion models and every time someone goes onto a computer and like types something you have to load it so you have to like go get a bunch of those gpus load the big model perform one inference step and then you're there then it's very expensive but if you have a big model that's just sitting there and you already reserve those GPUs, you have some kind of special agreement with the compute provider and the, and the model's just kind of sitting there always loaded onto these specific GPUs and then anybody that puts in a request, it just kind of gets put into the next batch that gets fed in at, uh, to perform inference, that's gonna be much cheaper. So it almost, like the more people that use it, the cheaper it becomes per image to, to perform uh, inference. But if not a lot of people are using it, the inference is going to be significantly more expensive because you have to load that model into the GPU memory, or in this case, the TPU memory. But uh, to the earlier point that we were talking about with, uh, or that you brought up with the actual pruning and mo reducing the size, I, if they were ever to put this in a production use case, they would definitely prune it. So they would go through the process of like going through all the weights, reducing the the uh, data types of those weights into like from floats into things like U and eights and even like more compressed data types that fit specifically on TPUs and they would probably prune it so that it can fit on the smallest and cheapest TPUs. So there's definitely a lot of stuff they can do to make this significantly cheaper at inference time. Um, but I think for this, right, this is a research paper. So like these guys didn't care. These guys they're, they're sitting in Meta's AI research and, and they can basically have a white carte blanche to print as much money as they want for this project, so. Give an overview. 
significant improvements in FID are obtained over all stages of training by making the transformer deeper and wider. You plot. Okay. Additional model compute is a critical ingredient for improved DIT models. And larger DIT models are more compute efficient. Okay, so training compute is model G flops times batch size times training steps times three where the factor of three roughly approximates the backward pass as being twice as compute heavy as the forward pass. Models are identical, blah, blah, blah. Okay. 10 to the 10 gigaflops. I mean, this is already crazy, right? Like gigaflops, like the word giga already means some huge multiple of factors of 10, and you have 10 to the 10th power gigaflops. Like that is, I don't even think we have a word within the kind of like metric system to describe what that even means. Okay. Following our scaling analysis, we continue training for 7 million steps. Should be bloop. Classifier free guidance. Blah, blah, blah. Performs better. It's cooler. Our method achieves the lowest FID of all prior generative model. Go. That's the big performance right there. We trained for only 2.3 million steps. So XL2 produces a total of 1064 tokens. Yeah, so this is an interesting point here, right, where with uh, diffusion models, you also have the choice of how many uh, noising steps to have, right? Uh, people call it sampling steps. So here they were using 256, but they say that you can actually change that, right, and you're going to get, uh, generally, if you add more sampling steps, you're going to basically be adding finer and finer noise and removing finer and finer noise, and you should kind of get higher quality. So... They try a couple different number of steps here. They go 16, 32, 64, 128, and so on, uh, sampling steps, and uh, figure 10. So different sampling steps here. And roughly the trend here, it seems, is more sampling steps you get slightly better results but then if you kind of it's there's kind of like a decaying uh trade-off here right where like past a certain point here you're adding a ton more sampling steps but it's not necessarily improving that much so there's kind of a sweet spot somewhere over here which is the 256 is the one that they wanted which is the second to last one uh <laughs> how many average train steps to get a good model uh, I think here they said 2.35 million steps. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I think there's like lag on this too. I'm I think I'm ahead of where the text is coming in. So sorry, M9. Um I think there's a way I can configure the streaming on YouTube so that it's like lower quality, but it's like there's less lag. But 
I don't know. I'm also not a very good content producer, as you can tell, you know. I don't know a ton about image editing or video editing when it comes to, like, YouTube creation. I'm just more of a computer vision, machine learning person. Okay. We're almost here, though. Let's, let's sprint to the end here. So they introduced diffusion models, blah, blah, blah. Given that future work should continue to scale DIT to larger models and token counts. We thank Kai Ming He. This, this dude is badass. This guy, Kai Ming He, like, I think he's actually the uh, original residual network dude. Yeah, I want to say he's the... Yeah, there you go. Deep residual learning for image connection. This guy came up with the uh, residual connections. And I think earlier I said it was 2015. It's actually 2016. So... This dude is fucking badass. This guy has been just publishing super high quality uh, computer vision stuff for a long time. So, you know, like that's the good part about working at Facebook AI Research is that you have all these kind of like heavy hitters here. I think Tim Brooks is also, this name sounds familiar to me as well. But cool. Let's see if there's anything interesting in the appendices here. So we have references, references, additional implementation details. I like these charts. So different model sizes. This is the correlation between gigaflops and uh, the different metrics. So you see here, obviously, more gigaflops, better FID. Look at some of these pictures. Uncurated 512 by 512 samples. I like how it uh, hallucinated a uh, classifier. Someone asked me a question about this. I'm gonna making some screenshots for a friend who's asking me what this is.
Okay, sorry, I got distracted there. Um, we were looking at the uh, images here. Some extra samples. Okay, these are these aren't that that much better. So. I think these are a little bit more realistic. You still see some of these artifacts that uh, you see in kind of generative art or generative AI stuff. So like, for example, here in this ship, right? Like it's still, it's a good ship and like all the kind of details are there where you have the, the wood and, and the texture is all correct, but there is nonsense here, right? That this, this post here is kind of coming out of the trees. It, it doesn't really connect with the boat. You have three posts. This one doesn't really seem to go anywhere. The the two kind of like uh, horizontal beams on this boat kind of connect together. So you have kind of the smaller high frequency details are correct in terms of the texture and the appearance and the consistency, but the higher level semantic, the low frequency details are not correct, right? It still doesn't have a perfect representation of like what an actual boat consists of and like what these posts actually mean relative to the concept of a boat. So you're still seeing a little bit of that uh, diffusion model kind of weirdness, but the, the quality is just so much higher that it's impressive. These lines are just so good. The wet fur on this otter, like look at that. That is crazy good. The grass texture too, like <laughs> these, these are so crazy. Yeah, you're getting a little weirdness, like look at these uh, pandas here. Like that, that tail is a little too thick, like the position of the leg and the arms a little weird. Here the tail again, a little bit too thick, the face losing the detail, but just look at this background. Look at this, the leaves, like the the the, sh the fact that the leaves kind of cover and go on top of the other leaves, like there's some very, very good stuff here. Um. Cool. This paper, this paper has me excited. This is super cool. I'm excited. 2023 is going to be crazy. Like, right? Because when you think about it, think about something like GANs, right? GANs, the original GAN paper was giving you, uh, original GAN paper. Uh, let's go here. Generative adversarial networks, the OG Ian Goodfellow GAN paper. Right, like look at this. That is where we were in in 2017. Like, you know, what I'm saying like this is this is the quality of the images that we were generating in uh, in 2017 when this came out, or 2014. Sorry, when this came out, and. If you look at GAN papers like four years after that, really not that much better. But now you're looking at, you're going in diffusion models. Like a year ago, diffusion models were way closer to that original GAN paper than this, right? So like the speed at which this stuff is getting better is accelerating. It's it's going faster, right? It was mo It's moving faster in the past two years than, it's, than it moved in the previous five years. So the speed is accelerating. So realistically, I could see this kind of stuff over the next year, just another step order in magnitude, right? Like you could see an API at the end of 2023 that you type, type in a text prompt and it gives you 4K video of what you typed in, right? So 
I mean, that just changes the entire world, right? Like if, if anyone can generate video on demand of anything, that is, our world is gonna just gonna be completely different. Everybody's just gonna be an AI art generator or like an AI content generator. That's basically every single human is just gonna be some, doing some version of that because there's just so much, so much power in that. Um, but yeah, this has me excited. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Hope this was interesting. Hope you guys have a, a good holiday break. And yeah, thanks for listening and see you guys later.